Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. I always get a lot of requests for this bird, and I've kind of avoided it up until now because, you know, it's a jet, and I like propellers. But I guess the time has finally arrived, so here we go. Before we actually get to the development of the 262, we need to talk about the invention of the turbojet engine, which is really what made the 262 special. For that, we need to be introduced to Hans von Oyn, who is known as the father of the jet engine. But wait, I can hear some people jumping up and down out there yelling, Frank Whittle is the father of the jet engine. Oh no, this episode is turning into some sort of Mori Povich, who's the baby daddy kind of show. But we don't need to do a paternity test. It's already been done. In 1991, both Von Oyn and Whittle won the Draper Prize for Engineering for their turbojet designs with the quote on the award saying that it was a simultaneous invention. Supposedly both men were okay with the shared paternity, seeing as they became friends after the war. All right, so let's get back to the story. Oyn ran his first jet engine, the Henkel HES-1, way back in 1937. This was an experimental test bench engine which ran on hydrogen, so it wasn't practical for real-world use. But it did work, and it proved the concept that a jet engine could work. But again, wait a minute, what exactly is a jet engine? Here's the quick and dirty lesson. In a reciprocating four-cycle piston engine, within each cylinder, valves and spark plugs control the sequence of the four cycles. Intake, compression, ignition, and exhaust. Back when I was teaching pilot ground school, I learned that replacing these terms with the more titillating suck, squeeze, bang, blow would be more memorable to the students. Suck, a down-going piston draws in a charge of fuel and air. Squeeze, this piston now upgoing compresses the charge. Bang, the squeezed fuel air charge is ignited, burns, expands, and pushes the piston down to produce power. And blow, the upgoing piston completes the cycle by pushing out exhaust gases, and then the cycle starts all over again. Notice that in a four-cycle engine, the only stroke producing power is the ignition, or bang, one. In a turbojet, all of these functions take place simultaneously within the straight line of the jet engine. In the front, a compressor wheel performs its job of drawing in and squeezing the incoming air, pushing it back, so suck and squeeze, and then the air is mixed with the fuel, burned, and then it rushes to escape through the power turbine at the back, so bang and blow. The whole thing is joined by one shaft, so the faster the turbine turns, the more air is compressed in the front. It's actually much more simple than a reciprocating engine, and the technology was already there from steam turbines. But to make it all work with the incredibly high temperatures within, well, that was the rub. It took a couple more years of privately funded tinkering at Heinkel to get the engine to run on a liquid fuel, and to deal with the overheating issues. But in August 1939, the first turbojet-powered aircraft, the HE-178V1, made its maiden flight. Hermann Göring, the head of the Luftwaffe, was not there, but Ernst Udet and Erhard Milch, Minister of Aircraft Production and Supply, were. Supposedly, they were not wowed by the top speed of 372 miles per hour and the very limiting 10-minute flight endurance, but maybe there was more than short-sightedness going on there, as the German Ministry of Aviation was actually already working on its own gas turbine technology, which would lead to the Junkers engines that would eventually power the still-to-be-conceived 262. So maybe there was a bit of technical rivalry there, too. BMW got into the jet business by buying out the Brandenburg Motor Works, or Bramo, also in 1939. Bramo already had a turbine engine in the works, and in August 1940, they fired it up for the first time and were disappointed. It only produced half the planned thrust, so it was back to the drawing board. 
prototypes. Meanwhile, over at Messerschmitt, they were also toiling away on what they called Project 1065, which was their answer to the RLM, or Ministry of Aviation's, request for a jet aircraft capable of at least 530 miles per hour and one hour's endurance. They were intending to use BMW's 003 engine, and understandably, the fuselage design came along much faster than the tricky engine development. So Messerschmitt had to work around that problem. In fact, the first prototype was actually powered by a good old-fashioned Junkers Yumo 210 piston engine in the nose, turning a propeller. The jets were originally supposed to be buried in the wing roots, but when it seemed that there was going to be, you know, a lot of changes to engine design, Messerschmitt moved them out to the underwing pods that we're familiar with now. When finally the BMW 003 engines were more or less ready, they installed them, but left the piston engine and prop in the nose, you know, just in case. And it's good that they did, because both jet engines failed on that first flight, requiring the old reliable piston engine to get them back to the field. The initial prototypes were tail draggers, but it was found that the tail wheel deflected the jet exhaust to negate the effect of the elevator. So plans were made to convert the 262 to a tricycle undercarriage. Other necessary changes were that the engines were heavier than planned, so to fix the center of gravity, the wings were swept back 18.5 degrees. Back at Yonkers, while working on their Yumo 004 jet engine, they were making discoveries that were both encouraging and discouraging. The good news was that they were discovering the overall simplicity of the jet engine design. For example, it would take about one-fifth of the man-hours to build the Yumo 004 as compared to the BMW 801 radial engine. Also, many of the parts could be made by very simple machining. On the other hand, the high temperatures encountered within the engine demanded parts made of exotic metals such as nickel, cobalt, and molybdenum in order to survive. But in a wartime environment, these materials were considered strategic and unavailable for large-scale production. So the turbine blades had to be made out of less than ideal metals, such as mild steel protected by an aluminum coating. So the engines could actually be built, but they would have a pretty short service life of only about 10 to 50 hours. The 262 started off being powered by BMW's engine, but with the engines burning out sometimes after only one test flight, the decision was made to switch to the slightly more reliable Yumo 004, which could last sometimes 35 hours before overhaul. One interesting feature of the new jet engines was that they could burn a variety of fuels. The preferred fuel was J2 jet fuel, which was handy as it could be made out of coal. But diesel, or a blend of oil and avgas, could also be used. Fuel burn was twice what the pilots were used to, so the 530 US gallons of fuel were burned up pretty quickly. The standard armament was to be 430 mm Mark 108 cannon, although different variants would be armed differently. Production. During the time that Germany would have wanted to be building as many of the jets as possible, Allied bombing was hitting aircraft factories as quickly as they could be repaired. Vast effort was made to disperse, hide, and harden the production facilities. Parts of planes were built in tunnels and former mines. It has to be said that slave labor from concentration camps was used to build 262s, and many tens of thousands perished in the effort to construct the 1,400 or so that were eventually put together. Operational History For a weapon system that had started development right around the start of the European War, it took a long, long, long time to get anywhere near operational status. For even as 262s began arriving from the factories, it wasn't the case of a new type of fighter, this was a new class of fighter. 
something about 150 miles per hour faster than anything the Allies had out there. So not only did pilots need to be trained on how to fly it, the Luftwaffe needed to learn how to use it. Famously, this dilemma went all the way to the top when, in 1943, none other than the Fuhrer himself pushed for the ME-262 to be used as a fast ground-attack bomber rather than an interceptor. He felt that as a bomber, the 262's great speed would make it invincible to enemy fighters, and thus the bomber would truly always get through. So, the fighter version of the 262 was known as the Schwalb, German for swallow, and the fighter bomber was called the Sturmvogel. The first unit formed to try out the 262 was Erprobungskommando 262, which was formed in April 1944 and lasted until September 1944, when it was broken up and used to form Commando Nowotny which was named after its commander, Walter Nowotny. There may be an impression out there that as the 262 was so advanced that it flew rings around Allied aircraft, had its way with them, and was invincible. That was not the case. If you flew with Commando Nowotny, the 262 was just about as likely to kill you as you were to get kills. The unit's daily diary is pretty depressing with almost every day, and sometimes multiple times a day, there are descriptions of losses of pilots and aircraft for engine failures and landing gear failures, fuel exhaustion force landings, shoot-downs during takeoff, crashes due to bird strikes, crash landings, flameouts, and blown tire accidents. On the 8th of November, 1944, Major Walter Nowotny himself was shot down and killed. During its time, the unit shot down 24 Allied aircraft, but lost 28 262s. Not a great balance sheet. But tactics were gradually being developed for the much faster jets. The Luftwaffe's usual head-on attack just didn't work for the jets. As the closing speed was much too fast and the rate of fire for the cannon too slow. There would only be a second or so of firing time and not enough time to aim properly. So they switched to attacks from the rear, diving in to speed through the bomber's little friend escorts and then pulling up to sharply bleed off speed and then having a few seconds to fire. The low muzzle velocity of the Mark 108 meant that you had to get in very close. Dive brakes would have maybe been useful to slow down for the firing run, but the 262 just didn't have them. Some 262s were modified to carry 24 unguided folding fin R4M rockets, 12 under each wing. These would be fired in a flank attack at the bombers when still out of range of their 50 cal guns. It only required a hit with one or maybe two rockets to devastate a B-17 or B-24. In September 1944, U.S. AAF General Karl Spatz worried that Allied daylight bombing might have to be stopped if enough jets took to the air. And more Luftwaffe jet units were being formed. In October 1944, a bomber unit, Kampfgeschwader 54, was formed and trained to use the 262 in the ground attack role. Following this, in January 1945, a new fighter wing, Jagdschwader 7, was established. A month later, in February, Lieutenant General Adolf Galland formed the fighter unit Jagdverband 44. But it was only in March that there were enough jets, trained pilots, and established operational doctrine to make a concerted attack on the Allied bomber formations. On the 18th of this month, 37 262s hit a force of 1,221 bombers and their 632 fighter escorts, and they knocked down 12 bombers and one fighter. Three ME 262s were lost. General Karl Spott's worries never really played out. There were never enough jets, pilots, or fuel to make a dent in the overwhelming numbers of incoming bombers and fighters. And Allied commanders learned tactics to beat the jets. 
The 262s were at their worst when they were low and slow for landing and takeoff. And there were just a few jet bases. So Allied commanders ordered these bases to be hit regularly by their own bombers. And Allied fighters were stationed above the bases to strafe 262s when taxiing, taking off, or landing. Number 135 RAF had a tactic with the colorful name of Rat Scramble when a 262 was reported in the area. These RAF pilots would take off in their Hawker Tempests and head not to where the 262s were, but to their bases in order to get them in the landing pattern. These tactics caused the Luftwaffe to assign Focke Wolf FW 190s and the new TA 152s to top cover to protect the vulnerable 262s who were in the circuit. Flak alleys were also set up over which the approaching 262s could fly, where gunners would try to knock down any Allied fighters that had locked on to the jet's 6 o'clock position. As the fighting area was squeezed tighter and tighter into the area around Berlin, 262s were more and more used in the ground attack role, hitting Soviet trucks and shooting down some IL-2 Sturmoviks. On the last day of the European War, a 262 shot down a Soviet P-39 Era Cobra. It was the last Luftwaffe victory of the war. Survivors there are many surviving static 262s that can be viewed in Germany, the US, the UK, Australia, South Africa, and the Czech Republic. Even more impressive are the flying replicas built by the ME262 project in Everett, Washington. These reproductions fly using the much more reliable Westinghouse General Electric CJ610 engines. I hope to see one in flight one day. If you like this kind of content, make sure you like and subscribe. You can uh, throw me a thanks, include a comment, and share with your other aviation nerdy friends. Until next time.